So welcome everyone to our webinar today. So can business be a force for good? So I'm Karen Stevens. I am the finance director here at Alpkit and I'll be running you through the plan for the next hour. Um, and then I'll be passing your questions that you can raise over to our panelists in our Q&A session. So we're really lucky today to be joined by some excellent panelists. So leading our discussion today is Rob Harrison. Now, Rob is one of the founders and also a director at the Ethical Consumer magazine so thanks for joining us today Rob. Yeah hi everyone hi yeah good to see you. Great to see you today Rob. Also on our panel we've got Kate Sandal. So Kate is um, the Director of Programs and Engagement at B-Lab UK so welcome to you today Kate. Thanks for having me. Hi everyone. We're also joined by Ollie Pepper. So Ollie is one of the co-founders and owners um, at Morvello. So it's great to have you here today, Ollie. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks. And our final panelist um, is, of course, our very own Alpkit CEO, David Hanney. So hi there, David. Hi, Karen. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to pass you over to Rob in just one moment to get started. He's going to start off with a couple of polls to start with today. And today is really about sharing our ideas and viewpoints. We'd love everybody to get as involved as possible. So uh, lots of questions on the Q&A would be fantastic. And um, we'll hear from the panelists now and then we'll aim to start the Q&A session around about five past twelve. So without further delay, Rob, it's, it's over to you. Right. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Rob from Ethical Consumer Magazine. Uh, we do shopping guides for ordinary consumers and we've been publishing them for 30 years and we look at the ethical records of the companies that, that sell you stuff. And we're quite famous for taking a dim view of what most companies say about sustainability. Um, and so we're here to kind of to, to, to be provocative. Uh, also, uh, for about 20 years, we've also been working with ethical companies to try and help them to sort stuff out and get it better. And we worked with Alpkit a couple of years ago to help set up some of the stuff that they do, which is why we're here, because we're sort of friends with Alpkit. Um, so before we start on the kind of thing proper, we're going to do a few polls. I think there are three. And the first one, we can pop that one up and I might just talk over the top of it. Well, and so vote away. So we're kind of doing, just, just click, and, click and vote on the poll as it comes up. We're just doing this to kind of get an idea of who's on the call and so that we can pitch what we say in, in a way that makes sense. Um, so uh, this, is, this is an amusing one. Can business be a force for good? This one, uh, I'm reading this out because apparently uh, this is gonna be recorded. And if you don't talk over the top of it, people on the recording have no idea what's happening. Um, so these have got some witty uh, comments like, uh, you know, it's the wrong question. Capitalism and the quest for economic growth needs to change or what lefty nonsense trusts the free market or Ugh, I thought this was going to be more fun. I'm in the wrong room. So this is a witty poll to start us off. Um, I had no idea how the voting is going, but maybe we could put the results up for that now because um, it can all happen really super quick. So there we good. Um, so. Um, Yes, yeah, so there's a big 84% of people, yes, but business is only part of it. We need consumers and governments to do their bit, which is kind of great. Uh, we like that. And 12% uh, and, and the next highest, yes, of course, business should, should lead the way. And thankfully, there is no one in the wrong room, or at least admitting to it at this stage, they might just have left. So that's the first one. Let's do the next poll, which is just about the issues, I think, that concern you the most or, you know, um, so let's let's do that one now. Um, so it, it's asking for what the top three issues are. And we've got things like climate change and animal welfare, levels of consumption. We've got modern slavery and working conditions, all that kind of stuff. Um, so people are going to be clicking away in there. Um, and um, what do you think? Yeah, I think yeah. Let, let's see. Let's see what the result of that is because uh, it all happens so quickly. Uh, there you go. Climate change, perhaps unsurprisingly, is the number one winner there. 84% are people putting that as their top concern. Second one, working towards a circular economy. That's really interesting. Um, and the third one, um, consumerism and the level of consumption, which is kind of linked <laughs> to the two above it. So there you go. Um, so those are the top three concerns of the people on the call. And then we've just got a final one. 
Uh, what do you think is the biggest obstacle in your workplace for taking action? Um, and I think there's just one answer to that one. Um, and there are things uh, like we're afraid of getting it wrong or it's too expensive or we haven't got a plan or the pandemic is more important. So there are a number of issues that people are picking there and we're very soon going to go to an answer. What do you think? Uh, let's, let, let's see what people think. Um, there you go. Uh, it's more split there. Most people haven't got a plan, actually. Uh, there's not enough time and it's too expensive of the, of the next two after that. Um, but there's, there's, there's a less obvious clear winner on that one. So there you go. That was all our polls. So in a sense, that's informed the panelists of, of who we've got on the call, the kind of things that are concerning you today. So in a sense, we can try and make that work uh, for you. So um, I'm just going to start off uh, for a moment, just just reflecting on the title a little bit and, and how I think this is going to work. Um, we've, we've got I'm just going to chat to each of the panelists briefly, uh, help them just explain a little bit more about what they're doing. And, and what their take is on this question. And so the question in, in front of us is, can business be a force for good? And I, it's interesting the way that it's framed because in, in a sense, the implication there is that most people think that it's not and actually business is a problem. So we're kind of starting this from, from, from the position that we think business is a problem because um, we're just, you know, we're allowing ourselves to entertain that it might be a force for good, but we're actually a bit worried about what it's doing. Um, so the you know so the question in front of us is, is 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 can it be a force for good? And we think you know and and obviously in a way it can because you can see exceptional businesses doing exceptional things, and we've probably got some of them on the call now, and we're going to hear about them. But in order for this just not to be a kind of nice polite discussion between everyone who's doing nice things, we need to kind of face the fact that there are other businesses out there who are certainly not a force for good. And um, some of them know it and don't care. <laughs> and some of them are trying, but just can't do it. Um, so there's a very big landscape of businesses out there, some of which are very po problematic. Um, and so although I'm going to have a, a initially a nice chat with each of the panelists about um, the stuff that they're doing and, and, and telling us a little bit about more where they're coming from, I think we've got some difficult questions underlying can business be a force for good because time's running out and we think that probably business is is not being uh, quite as a force for good as it should be. So I'm going to go to David uh, first, uh, who's going to, I guess, David, just tell us a little bit about what Alpkit is doing. Um, I can I can kick you off with perhaps a more. I, I noticed on the front of your sustainability report that's just out, you've got um, You've got, uh, what is it? It's it's people and planet before profit, which I quite like. Yeah, and, and and I noticed that, you know, it's not a triple bottom line there. It's a kind of, <laughs> you've, you've got the two first and then you've got profit afterwards, which I guess most business people would go, hell, you got to make a profit first. How can you possibly say that? So tell us a little bit about the decision making that, that, that led you to do that. And just a bit more about Alpkit. I guess most people on the call will know a bit, but tell us a bit about Alpkit. So um, very quickly about Outkit. Thanks, Rob. Um, Outkit, we design and make and sell uh, outdoor clothing, bikes, camping equipment. And most people will know us. We sell online through our website. And we've also got four shops in the UK, soon to be six shops in the UK. When uh, Outkit was founded way back in 2004, I think we were one of the first um, outdoor brands that listed at that point what we called our policies, which included things like fair pay to suppliers, trying to do the right environmental thing. Um, and since 2014, we've been updating our, our policies. And then we came to you, Rob, in 20, 2018, and you really helped us hone our thinking. And it opened up a much broader world for us of just the breadth of sustainability. And that really helped us define our sustainability principles, which is reduce, reuse, re repair, recycle, respect the environment, treat animals humanely, work with people who believe in, build a better business, and give back and then last year we did a b corp assessment and b corp has been really powerful for us because it's given us a framework that we can follow and it's um not only just helped us uh in terms of making real change in in our workplace on on sustainability but it's also set the massive amount of work that we've got to do ahead of us in improving environmental uh environmental work with our suppliers 
things like lower impact materials, renewables in the supply chain uh, and recycling. And the other aspect that is really worth talking talking about is the aspect of profit, because one of the things we see is that it isn't actually at the cost of profit. Um, and it's just something you've got to do to, to do it right. So I definitely think people and planet and profit are the things that we're aligned on. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, okay, excellent. So I mean, I, so, you know, we, we're kind of, everyone on, on the call, you know, the big uh, answer that everyone liked was that we know that it's not just a few businesses that need to, we need to kind of take government and consumers and we, you know, we need to, to make this into a bigger movement rather than a few mm. folk doing the right thing. And so, so what, I mean, what's, is Alp, what Alp, what's Alpkit doing with the kind of broader business areas? I know that you guys certainly we used to do things with other outdoor companies and what are you doing stuff around regulation? Are you doing stuff? What, what are you doing to kind of push other businesses into the right space? Well, we're working quite closely with the Outdoor Industries Association and some of our teams, they've got a really powerful sustainability and development board that we participate with. And guys, Nick, Ronnie, people at Alpkit are on with IOCA, the European Outdoor um, Group, are on panels with those kind of groups. There's, there's a lot going on actually within the outdoor industry. But one of the other aspects is we really believe that um, being open and transparent and sharing information, which is the sustainability report we've just done, is being part of the conversation and informing the conversation. And that's something that we really need to do. And this webinar is probably part of that process as well. Of, of having an open dialogue about cons uh, about sustainability and, and what that means. Um, so I think those are the main three areas. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm noticing some questions pop up there, which I'm trying not to look at, but I'm kind of looking at them anyway. And someone was going, I need to leave. Can I watch this later? And I think the answer is yes, because it's going to be put on the, some, somewhere on the Outkit uh, site. Well, it, it'll be hosted later on. Um, so, so yeah, David. I'm a, a, one of the things that you mentioned uh, in, in in some of the discussions that we had earlier. The, you, you said, um, "What's a, how how do you balance sharing information about sustainability uh, without falling into virtue signalling?" Was an interesting question, and I kind of, you know, I I I take the view that um, virtue signalling is uh, at the core of moral action and actually it's not a bad thing to do and I kind of think that it's a partly you know in a, in a sense virtue signaling is a language created by you know uh, businesses that would rather people didn't do this stuff and actually you need to virtue signal um, so that you can give other people the confidence to do the same thing um, I mean, I, you know, there is there is also a, an aspect that, that that kind of boasting is is not a particularly attractive trait. Um, so, what's your take on what's your take on that, David? Do you well, have we, def a we definitely over the past few years recognise that um, you have to be you have to share who you are and what you're about, and actually sharing information is really important. Um, and people are asking us questions, and it just made us. Feel that we should be more opening and share information over the past five six years so it's a definite aspect that people are making judgments about you just based on the information you put on the website i think what you have to do is balance um what you what you're saying with real action so that what's important for us first is to take real action on things then talk talk about things and try and be comprehensive in what you do so i think the sustainability report that we put forward is a, a genuine attempt to be as balanced as we can and be as open as we can to help that that con con conversation um, and to share to share and take questions and be open and and on as honest as we can be with people, there's aspects which I'm really sensitive about. I think we spoke the other day about um, the low cost it is. So the the cost of actually offsetting carbon at the moment is incredibly inexpensive. You know, we we offset this year and and all of our all of our all of our scope one scope two CO two emissions. And it's literally hundreds of pounds. So it's, there's really no excuse for people not to offset, but that shows in itself that the system is, is broken, really. The carbon economy isn't balanced right. If companies can offset their entire scope one, scope two emissions for several hundred pounds, it shows the thing is wrong and it's not the answer. So I'm kind of really wary about people banging the drum of being clim climate neutral or that kind of aspect, if it's actually just a few hundred pounds to, to offset things, which is why I think publishing comprehensive report and being open about things. So I'm really conscious that we're not uh, jumping on a bandwagon about saying we're climate neutral when actually we've got so much work ahead of us to do. Um, but I do think the, 
the framework that B Corp has, has set out and that you helped us with in establishing our sustainability principles has been really helpful for us in giving us a handrail to know what to go through and to help us build a plan um, and recognizing how far we've come and what we've still got to do. So I actually think, you know, the, the budding up and working with people like B Corp has been really, really helpful for us. And that's something that everybody can do. And it's, there's a free online tool that you can use, which is the start of our work with B Corp that's been really powerful for us. Oh, excellent. Well, you're kind of leading into into my because we've sort of we've done the 10 minutes, which is your slot. So and you, you've led us nicely into uh, B Corp. Um, so maybe uh, I, we can we can go over to Kate and and Kate. So just tell us a little bit about B Corp for people who maybe don't know about it and just give us a bit of kind of explain what it is that you do. Yes. Yeah, no problem. So um, David's been talking about it from, from a community's perspective and, and the certification. So the idea of meeting kind of a really high standard of environmental and social performance, amending your governing documents. So you um, embed the kind of that triple bottom line that you were mentioning earlier, Rob, um, into the DNA of your business. So you amend your articles of association. Um, and that's that's great and that's brilliant, but this all feeds into a bigger thing that we're trying to achieve. And um, it's at the root of what we think are the, the, the major problems that are facing the world today. So um, we have a big bold aim of changing capitalism. We want to change the operating system. So we don't think capitalism is bad. We just think the way that it's working at the moment is. And that way it's working is towards shareholder primacy. So the reason a business exists is to provide profits for its shareholders. Now, if we shift that, we introduce that idea of people, planet, profit and actually being able to balance the way that businesses operate, um, we'll be able to create change. And so we say that the climate emergency, we say racial injustice, social inequality are all symptoms of system failure. And that system failure is because we look towards shareholder primacy as the lead role when it comes to running businesses. So we're just trying to untangle that and create change. And the way that we're trying to do that is one, creating a certification. So businesses are able to verify that they're walking the talk um, and that they're meeting these high standards uh, and, and then, you know, improve once they certify as well. So another thing, really important thing to know is that people are not perfect. They're not the best businesses in the world, but they're doing good stuff and they're willing to be independently verified and they've met quite high standards. Um, and then you've got uh, the fact that the assessment, and, and David just mentioned this, is free for anyone to use. So we've had over 70,000 businesses worldwide who are just using our, our tool. Um, it takes over five different areas of, the, of your business. So your governance, your workers, your environment, your community, which includes your supply chain and your customers. And so we ask you questions all about those and anyone can use that. And then the third thing, and I've seen this kind of come up a little bit in some of the, the q and A's, is that businesses alone won't be able to create that change. And, and absolutely, and we saw that in the poll. And what we also need to do is a multifaceted approach. So how do we engage everyone else in this, but specifically um, government? So in the US where we started, um, where shareholder primacy reigns supreme, the idea that um, a business should operate for the purpose of the people and planet as well as profit was really quite unheard of. So they actually changed legislation and have done that in 35 states. Um, we've also done it in Italy, Colombia, um, British Colombia, in Canada, Ecuador, um, and it's pending in about seven other countries. And then that leads me to the UK, uh, where what we're, what we're doing is we are actually launching a campaign to um, mandate, and this is the difference from all of the other legislation that we've done, but mandate that all businesses define their purpose, have a material positive impact on people and planet. And the way that we know that they're doing that is that they do an annual report every year, and that's called the Better Business Act. So um, lots of different ways of, of looking to engage, but I think it's a both and when it comes to a lot of this stuff. So yes, great certified businesses build a community, but also let's think about the other stakeholders who are involved in creating that change as well. Okay, yeah, that, and that's that's super interesting stuff. So with, with your with with B corporations, how how is it how how are kind of uh, how's big capital with that? Are you mainly certifying smaller companies? Or, you know, companies owned by pension funds, companies with lots of 
big institutional shareholders? Are they happy with the conversion to B Corporation? What's going on there at the, at the much larger company level? Yeah, I think there's two ways of thinking about this. So you've got publicly listed companies um, where, where kind of shareholder primacy reigns supreme, especially when they're, when they're traded. Um, and so we have quite a few of those, not as many as we would like. Um, one of the biggest ones that people probably have never heard of, which is Natura, and that's uh, listed on the Brazilian uh, stock exchange. But what's interesting about Natura is they also own the body shop Aesop and Avon. Uh, and so they're a publicly listed company that is doing incredibly well and have acquired those companies that the last ones I just listed since they certified as a B Corp. And um, the other thing I think to kind of think about this question is, what are the investors doing? How are they responding to this? So are they certifying? And, and the answer is yes. So although at the beginning we did have kind of a huge group of impact investors who obviously aligned in what we're doing, but actually what are those kind of mainstream investors doing and how are they doing it? So we've got um, something like Towerbrook, which has a huge amount uh, under management. It's I think I've said three trillion before, but I want to just check myself because I think that's a little large, but it's it's really quite massive. Uh, one of the biggest uh, private equity firms and um, that is certified. And then you've got other more established, older institutions like Lombard ODA, which is a uh, the oldest private Swiss bank um, that is also certified as well. So um, this is coming from multiple different angles and yes, it's important to get your investors on board, but I think a lot of investors are starting to think that actually this is a this is a no brainer, and, it, and that isn't certification, but acting more responsible, being aware of your impact. Um, not only does it help attract the right talent, de-risk your business because you're looking at different areas, but also kind of tackle areas that potentially would. Um, influence the future of the planet, whether that's the climate emergency or whether that's your supply chain. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, and 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 additionally, and I'll stop talking <laughs> after that. But uh, Larry Fink from BlackRock, who writes a letter every year um, for the last, I think, five or six years, he's really been talking about this now. Whether Larry puts his money where his mouth is is another question that's always uh, prompted much debate and they're not always perfect. But the reality is he's setting the tone and he's being very public about their support for business behaving like that. And that is really important. We're not there yet. We're not, you know, we don't have complete buy in, but actually we are seeing shifts from large institutional investors who are supporting this way of doing business. Right, and, and we've just got a couple of minutes left. So but just a, a final, a quick one is, is that lots of, I know for, for Alpkit, the B Corporation was, was partly there to kind of embed it in the company as it grew in case it took in extra capital or new people and all. It was about kind of getting that baked in um, before all this stuff happened. Um, mm -hmm. And so, the, you know, the kind of tricky question, has anyone ever, has anyone ever become a B Corporation and changed because the baking in wasn't hard enough? I mean, do you have people that pop out again because, you know, they get a majority yeah. and change the articles back again? You know, uh, yeah, yeah, we do. And, you know, we can't, we can't future proof that. We can't say it's in there forever. Uh, I'm not sure any business would ever certify if we say once we're in, we're not coming out again. So um, there, there, there is an exit strategy, but for some businesses who, who don't feel it's right for them anymore or they're acquired, um, it's very, very low. And, um, you know, we had a very small percentage, I think four businesses um, not continue certifying last year, um, which is a huge amount, uh, a, a very small amount in comparison to the businesses that we have. Uh, and a lot of them, some of them were, were acquired and they're acquired by larger businesses. And what we're starting to see now is those who may have decertified um, two or three years ago, and we've literally just had this with, um, the company was called Good Brand and they're acquired by Anthesis. And then thesis, um, you know, 50 million turnover sustainability consultancy. And they were like, oh, God, you know, it's going to be hard, hard push for them. And then they've literally just certified. So although we might lose some because they've been acquired, actually, it just takes that business that's acquired them a bit longer to to kind of to certify. And that's great. And we're also seeing that with well-known brands in the UK. And we've got programs called um, movement builders for very, very large corporates. Um, to be able to start engaging with with the movement and how do they start creating that change to be able to ready them to, to certify. So, um, yes, we do lose some businesses, but often um, it's through acquiring um, rather than anything else. 
Okay, fantastic. Well, that's the time up. So we've we've got the last last ten minutes. We're just going to uh, meet Ollie from Morvello. So, Ollie, just give us a little bit for people who have no idea about what you are, who you are, and what you do, and then we can get on to some tricky questions. Yeah, great. So Morvello, you know, we're the I guess represent the the small brand. So even though we're going twelve years, we produce cycle clothing mainly. Um, but there's still five of us, you know, so we're one of the many very kind of micro brands that in the UK. Um, we also have the Overland, which is um, kind of cycle wear, but still more active outerwear. And that was our first little foray into producing, I say, more sustainable goods. It was looking at versatility within clothing and how you can reduce your wardrobe. Um, but we're, yeah, we're kind of the... Um, I guess that we've kind of quite been open over the last three years about you know our, our lack of sustainability and how we can change the business to be more sustainable. So, so cycle wear is yeah is a core business, but then we've also off the back of our sustainable journey, I guess, started a new business called Circular Inc, which is looking at washing, fixing, repairing, um, keeping clothing in circulation for longer and. To work in partnership with brands who you know might not have that the facilities that outkit would have for example in-house so it's kind of it's kind of morphed the sustainable journey i guess is has kind of morphed into several different directions i hadn't planned really uh, okay then so so i mean is and, and and how's how's business going in the pandemic is it all fine are you all just kind of ticking along and there's no big panic uh, yeah it's well, I mean, luckily cycling is one of the few things that was, you know, allowed over the, the pandemic. So, you know, we've kind of been lucky to keep, you know, keep trading through that. Um, uh, Brexit provides another issue. But um, yes, it, we've been lucky. So, yeah, the pandemic has, um, I think it's encouraged people to get out outdoors more. So even when I'm cycling around the South Downs, you know, I'm on paths where I've not seen people on for 15 to 20 years and suddenly like all these people are suddenly discovered the outdoors and yeah hopefully that translates into maybe you know optimistically it might translate into better stewardship for the countryside you know people are maybe hopefully more in tune with nature and make decisions accordingly but we'll we'll wait and see and, and so and, and being so you're a micro business and it's really obvious you know all the staff will know what's going on all the time in a kind of company that size are you kind of do you ever fall out over sustainability decisions or is it all kind of is it all everyone is on the same page and you know how's how's all that working out yeah we're all you know yeah i mean the, the good thing about a micro business is there's no you know tiers of management it's more you know its own collaboration really so we're all on an equal footing um but yeah we're all we're all on the you know the same page with it i think um we're all i guess, I guess we're all coming at it from the same point of view you know we're um everyone's keen to get involved and you know keen to pursue things as well um to make the business more sustainable and you know we're, we're kind of going through the process of trying to become b corp you know certified um but it's it's not an easy you know tick box exercise you can just rattle off in an afternoon you know as i discovered uh, last year but um but it, what has been useful about that is it does e even though you know the time spent doing it is is significant and and so that's hard for a small business where you're kind of doing a lot of different things all at once you know you're kind of um you know you're pulled all over the place really but what has proved useful is that I have this kind of um, inner B Corp voice of like any any decision you, you come to, you know, you have a think of, well, how can I how can I do it differently? You know, what could be the more sustainable? And I say that sustainable in its kind of catch all term, but what could be a better option of doing things? So and that could be anything. It could just be, you know, your electricity supplier to the to the warehouse or it could be logistics of you know shipping products from from the far east or or maybe it's not from the far east maybe it's looking at a new supplier in in europe and you know it's 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 amazing at how it kind of by going through that online impact assessment on b corp it kind of it makes you analyze the business even if you're not b corp certified i think it kind of 
it, it brings things to the surface where you don't initially consider them and suddenly you go actually this you know this this sustainable journey is actually kind of far more uh comprehensive than than we probably initially thought uh, great i'm going to just slightly move out of format now and ask kate a question because that raised the question so be cool if you got do you have exactly the same forms for all different sizes of business or do you have different criteria for different ones i know ethical consumer we rank everyone from micro businesses to giant multinationals and we have different criteria standards for the smaller ones because it simply isn't possible to have massive policies across everything when you're a micro business and, and so how, how do you deal with that kind of approach yeah so we've got um we have one assessment um but it's weighted and gated so depending on the information that you give us at the beginning your size your sector your location but really between kind of emerging markets and developed markets when we say um location um, you, you get slightly different questions in the same way that if you don't have any employees, um, we won't ask you questions about what your policies and practices are when it comes to, to employees. So, so it's, it's essentially it's the same assessment, but it's appropriate for, for the business that you're in. Although because it's the same assessment and because it's for every business, uh, there aren't many businesses who take the assessment and say, oh, this was perfect for me. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, that's, that's the challenge. It, you know, the assessment isn't perfect um, for every business of, of every size. And we're trying to kind of, we're working on that at the moment, actually. And one of the big things that we're starting to do is really look at our assessment criteria and what would a 2.0 look like? So um, we're going through a massive review of our performance um, criteria to certify as a B Corp and are there some minimum requirements or minimum things that businesses have to do so potentially shifting to an assessment where there are just some bare minimums regardless of um, size um, or sector but that's TBC at the moment we don't know where that will go. <laughs> I'm encouraged there's until the 15th of February um, if you google I'm sure it will come up but the performance requirements for B Corp you can submit uh, on our survey because we're looking for as many people to input whether you're a B Corp or not into what the assessment should look like. Okay, great. So we've got kind of three minutes left on, on my timing uh, schedule thing here. And so maybe an interesting, you know, an interesting game. So we looked at, uh, you know, you know, business can be a force for good, but we need regulators and consumers to be on side. If you leave consumers to me for the moment, because that's my specialist subject. But, but if you were to have a, if you could, you know, if you were the regulator for one day and you could make one regulation, what would it be? And I, you know, I, I'll go around the three of you and, and you can have a think about what would your regulation be? I mean, perhaps David's might be around carbon pricing because you've told us a little bit. About yeah, yeah. It. <laughs> or, you know, or, and, and perhaps Kate's might be around, you know, requiring people to report, but, you know, so, so, you know, I, I'll, I don't know who to pick for last. I'll pick David first and then Kate and then Ollie. So the, you, you've got a bit of a chance to think about it because that's a well, bit of a hard one just to kind of pull out the sky. Definitely agree that uh, governments have got their role to play and regulation is, is super important. So many rules are just written backward looking and so much bad stuff can happen just as a matter of course until until it's regulated against. And actually, I, I like the, um, the move that the government has done with electric cars by just setting a, a phase out date has just raised the awareness of electric cars and electric vehicles so much. That's really powerful. So, and I actually, you're quite right. The the carbon offsetting is just um, it's a nonsense at the moment, and it's not part of our journey to net zero. But I think it's something as part of the process you would go through. So, carbon offsetting and, and clarity over um, climate change would be really really powerful for me. Yeah, just sort climate change, government. There you go, Kate. Well, you've got you've got one law you could make tomorrow. What would it be? Uh... Gosh. Um, I, I, I totally agree on uh, carbon pricing. I think, you know, that's that's such an important area that is, you know, is allowing so many people to underprice uh, the impact that they're having. And, and also is a real challenge when it comes to offsetting, which so many businesses are now doing when it comes to net zero. And yeah, and, and we're, we're not accounting properly. So uh, my old boss used to say accountants will save the world if they just put themselves to it, they'd be able to find the right accountancy metrics. Um, but, but I have to say the Better Business Act, because that's what we're launching uh, this year. And I think, you know, being able to ensure to exactly when uh, David said about the government raising awareness, setting the bar, you know, 
talking about electric vehicles now everyone is engaging with that topic in the same way that if you say you've got to have a material positive impact on people and planet and know why you exist as a business um you know that enables people to reflect and to ask themselves questions about what they're doing and how their business practice affects the the planet and the people around them okay <clears throat> so ollie you've got you've got one law what, what 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 do you want it to be you've had all of kind of a minute and a half to think about it yeah so it should be a really good one shouldn't it so um <laughs> um but you no know, i think um, i'd like to ha how you word this but essentially make companies almost more responsible for their products after they've been sold to the consumer so you know whether that's take take back you know recycling it's kind of it's i think there just needs to be more accountable accountability from the kind of the, the brand organization side you know if they're if they're taking these raw materials making it into something passing it on you know, I think there should be systems in place that enables consumers to easily, you know, take back or recycle or send back. And it's a brand's, it's a brand's responsibility to do that. Great. Fantastic. No, I really like that. It was worth giving you that minute and a half there because that, that was fantastic. So we are now at 12.05, which is the time that I was meant to hand back to Karen, who is going to manage the Q&A pro process. So Karen, over to you. Thank you very much, Rob. And I think we'd all agree that's been a, a really interesting discussion that we've had so far. And we've got lots of fantastic questions that have come in. So we're going to start off with a question from Steve Swinney. Thank you, Steve. So we briefly mentioned before the, the dreaded word Brexit. And Steve's question um, is around, is the break from EU to national legislation likely to hinder or aid sustainable business models? So I will allow, uh, would anybody like to step forward and answer that one? I could say something about Brexit and sustainable business models because our experience is we, we, Europe has been a really significant part of, of Outkick um, and it is just so difficult at the moment to sell into the EU. There's double duties, um, backlogs and that isn't going to, I can't see a way through that just in the short term. So I think we're all clear that the free trade agreement was just not a free trade agreement. And that puts it as in a really, really challenging situation. So I think in, in answer to sustainability, um, Brexit just isn't helpful for, from that perspective, um, particularly if you're looking at things like renewable energy, which is um, access to renewable energy, that is just far, far more challenging, I think. Um, and that's almost irrespective of your political persuasion, whether you think um, Brexit is a good idea or, or a bad idea. It's, it's just introduced obstacles and barriers to, to uh, solving global, global prob problems, which is an added burden that isn't helpful to, the, to their solutions. OK, thank you for that, David. Um, we've got a question from Zoe here um, who is asking what metrics should be used by all businesses to quantify their impact or efforts in sustainability? And then an add on question, is there a common metric or not? So who would like to answer that one? I'll, I'll, I'll give I'll give you a go in that. So so, you know, this is the decade of climate change where everyone's realised that if we don't sort it in the next 10 years, we're all toast. So everyone is taking it much more seriously than they have been in previous decades. And we noticed um, we noticed um, uh, David talk about outkit scope one and two emissions, um, which is so the metric is measuring carbon impact and at ethical consumer, we think that that's not good enough. And we think that people should be finding out about their scope three emissions and managing those down too. And scope three is all the stuff in your supply chain. So you need to get on the phone to your suppliers and ask them how much you know electricity they're using, or you, know, you need to get carbon impacts all the way down the supply chain, measure those and take responsibility for getting them down so for for us at ethical consumer for our drive for the next few years is just getting businesses to understand about scope three and take responsibility for it and that single metric is, is probably the most important one for, for us at the moment okay excellent thank you rob and um, we've also had a question here around um somebody said as a consumer they struggle with the balance of supporting brands doing sustainability well and supporting the reuse movement um and they are struggling with the disposal of products no longer use or no longer function 
um, she find it really useful if shops or brands would sell second-hand products. Um, I don't know if Ollie, you've got any thoughts on this. I know you mentioned before about circular ink um, that relates quite well to that. Yeah, we. I mean, we. There are brands who you know already do do that take back, you know, and kind of repair. Um, circular ink was, you know, our. I mean, Morvello are starting it, but circular ink is a way of. Um, increasing the impact because no matter how much change we did to Morvello it's quite small but so circular ink is there to 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 work it's not customer facing it's behind the scenes it's helping brands uh you know take back clothing from customers um and find every possible use for it so it could be repaired if it can't be repaired can it be upcycled and if it can't be upcycled can it be disassembled um and recycling is a very last option because at the moment you know, the, the recycling technology isn't there to kind of really to make new fibres from old fibres. It's still in its infancy. Um, so I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's the consumers putting the pressure on the brands to to kind of, you know, have that take back scheme, you know, so you can, individuals can kind of reduce, you know, reduce uh, their, in, you know, their footprint and or even have it repaired and it's the brand's responsibility to then also have it recycled so okay can thank I, you Ali, for that can i make a comment on that because um as part of what we do we have the repair station so we repair or or we wash downproof or reproof your garments and that's any brand garments so if you send them to us we will we'll repair and um amend to, so they can be more durable and last a lot longer we've also got a continuum project which is where we'll take back any any uh, outdoor products and we find a new home for them. So we've par partnered up with about a dozen charities. And the, the idea being is that products that you may no longer use, send them back to us and we'll find a home for those. And we pledge it, none of them will go to landfill. It will all end up back through other charities. And I think that's a role that as a as a brand we can play, uh, play quite widely. So, you know, use the return service, post them back free post to us, we pass them on to charities that can, that can make use of them and give life uh, products a new, a new life. As a part of that, we were thinking about, or have thought about, we haven't quite thought about how, whether we've got a role to play in reselling as well. I think there's quite good existing channels for reselling. There's um, Thomas Taylor Foundation, a local charity that has got, is a charity shop dedicated to outdoor gear. And it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, business that does a lot of good in its own right. And other charity shops are good places. And as well, there's eBay, which is, you see a lot of outdoor activity and almost encourage that behavior in terms of reselling. So there is an aspect that uh, I've seen in the US, a few brands have started reselling their own gear and you know, the history of, you know, I've got a love of guitars and the history of secondhand guitars is really, really quite, quite big of peak brand selling them. So there is a place for reselling product and um, we can play a role in that. But our focus right now is repair. And when you're done with the product, product pass it on to someone who can give it, give it a second life. Excellent, thanks for that, David. Um, I just wanted to say I think something else that I think is a really interesting idea that I um, want to socialize as much as possible, which is how are we gonna save our high streets when so many retail stores disappear? And actually, I think there's a real market for repair shops and people being able to kind of take stuff back. And, you know, there's, a, there's a, I think, a rise in, in charity shops on, on, on high streets to some extent, but I think there's a real opportunity for people to learn and craft, um, but also to just take it into a shop and get it fixed. Um, and hopefully that will kind of keep our, when we realise that consumerism and wastefulness is such a massive problem, then how do we solve it with another problem that we have? And I think there's a huge opportunity there. So um, anyone got a high street near them? Uh, let's see what we can do. Excellent. Great so point. Because okay. this has been for a while and um, Gear for Good is a really good charity that will find like. Uh, find a product at home as well that's which has been around for a long long time 
We're getting quite a few questions in, um, probably for more yourself, Kate, actually, around B Corp. So there's a number of questions um, around about, I know you, met, you touched on it earlier before, but about um, smaller businesses. Um, there's a question from John Trainer here, can a sole trader become B Corp certified? And also it links into Andrew Morgan's question around what support is available for micro and small businesses trying to achieve B Corp, and not just financial, but more guidance and advice. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to, to add on that. I know you touched on it earlier. Yeah, so I was actually just I'm trying to respond to some of these so it doesn't dominate the, <laughs> the conversation, but um, uh, small micro businesses, yes, sole traders, yes, uh, it becomes a little bit harder because you've got to earn your 80 points, um, not in the workers section when you become a sole trader, and you won't be able to amend your articles if you don't have a, um, a company to, to amend them for. So it is possible we do have sole traders in the community. Um, but yeah, there's just it's potentially a little bit more challenging there. Um, and then the support wise, uh, you, you know, you don't need a consultant to certify the vast majority of businesses who have certified haven't used anyone, they've just done it themselves. And I think that's really important. And actually, for smaller businesses where you know um, who your suppliers are, and you don't need to go to anyone else where you can capture that information very simply potentially it's actually easier for you than an organization that has multiple stores and multiple locations or um you know is a, is a larger organization so there are kind of you know there are wins depending on which way you want to see it um also a lot of the questions on the on the b-impact assessment have kind of uh, explainers there and a bit more information we have something called knowledge base as well which has a bit more detail on stuff um so so yes there's there's lots of information out there um and and you should be able to do it without any support from us that's great thanks kate um, now we've had a question from from colin fisher um, and he would like to know how do we distinguish rubbish from truth and what companies say about sustainability i don't know if you want to to come into that one rob yeah okay that's that's our specialist subject i guess um I, you know i you just have to do the research really I, th I don't think there's a th there isn't a shortcut. Well, I mean, other than reading Ethical Consumer magazine, which has done the research for you, um, but you know, you just have to spend the time checking it out. And you know, we I guess we we on average we say it takes us about four hours to research a company because we do whatever two hundred every quarter or this kind of stuff, uh, and we have to do that. But but probably that's about the amount of time you need to kind of check. You know all the local newspapers to make sure it's not kind of you know employing modern slaves or all this kind of stuff that can do you have to get in touch with them read all the materials you can learn quite a lot from what they say by the language that they use and we've got quite a developed system that can look at you look for weasel words, don't you? Where possible, we like to pay the living wage or whatever, this kind of stuff. You know, you get used to finding this kind of language. And so we have some quite developed metrics that can look at a policy and sort them into rubbish, good and, and excellent. Excellent. Thanks for that, Rob. Um, we've had a, a good point in from Rosie Watson as well. So she said it would be great to talk about the elephant in the room, which is reducing the number of products made and reducing consumerism. And that's she's not talking about the end of life repair schemes, but doing it at the stage of advertising and marketing and really not encouraging consumers to buy things that they, they don't need. I think it's a really good discussion point there. I don't know if anybody would like to come in and add some views on that. It's, it's, it's definitely a hard one. I mean, again, from a micro business side, you know, where in the scale of things, we're not making a huge amount of stuff, but we are still making things and it is still damaging. And it's still, you know, still based on consumerism. You know, we're still trying to encourage people to buy things, you know, to keep the business going. And whether that's, you know, from recycled or whether it is secondhand ones. So I think it's a challenge. I think it's it's not a quick fix, but I think it's a journey. I think it has to be, you know, with there's an increasing acceptance about uh, the secondhand markets. It's trying to, I think, form a new business model based on using existing textiles. Uh, that's a bit of a focus we have at the moment through, well, more value and circular ink is just like how there's, a, if, if everyone wants to say, right, you can no longer, you know, buy, you know, textiles from mills, you know, what, what could we do with this huge surplus that we have and how can you make that commercially viable? So it's almost like you are just trying to, make a new machine you know it's not you can't really tinker the old machine to make it work you you really do have to kind of 
you know start new systems really so um but the collaboration side really helped so that's why i'm here because of introductions with with david at outkit and they've been really supportive of you know a small business such as ours to help us make a change as well so i kind of wanted to add that in there actually like the working together i think is is a noticeable difference that i found in the kind of sustainable you know push really i've got a thought thought on that as well because um we uh there's a big kind of contradiction because we we make product and we sell product and how that's what our business is and through people buying product from us is how you know the people who work at Outkit it it feeds us and we've got a hundred households that are, are reliant on us trading and trading profitably to to keep going um, and alongside that we're I kind of put us in the age-old outdoor industry of we make products we tr try it test it take it back, look to improve it. And so that love of product, love of innovation is really part of what we what we do. And when we're out on the hill, you kind of, you think, God, does the world need another outdoor brand? But then when you're out on the, you're out and you see what people wear, you think, oh my God, but if you just made it like this, or you change the polymers, then you make, you can make a product that's actually better and more appropriate for that, that situation. So we, we put through this, um, in our design ethos that actually making products that are far more durable and far far more recyclable at the end is is a way to go and and products that take out um you know you don't need 20 different waterproofs most people have just got one waterproof which is their waterproof by making products with a real specific purpose and with a bit of crossover that's long lasting and durable is a is a really good way to go and we completely reject that kind of um big retail estate of filling an estate 400 shops full of product in spring summer and, and then the job is to get it sold as quickly as possible because in autumn winter you've got another lot of product arriving so we try and flow product in which means we can react very quickly and we can innovate really quickly and improve really quickly which is part of that of that cycle so i'm really aware that we are dependent on consumerism of a certain level but we hope by being more durable in the products that we make good use of technology um, I think one of the aspects of when we talk about innovation is that the very definition of innovation is changing now, uh, where it was on the basis of lightweight, technical performance, breathability, waterproof. I think the definition is changing to include sustainability. And in the next five years, we'll be looking at durability, recyclability, uh, end use and performance of a product, which does it, which does I mean overall we, um, I think we make better products so whilst we're on one level we we encourage durability and recyclability and reuse on the other aspect we um I know we're dependent on on outdoor activity but which is a good thing to do I want to get more people out outside and enjoying the outdoors um, and having effective kit is a real part of that I could come in on the reducing consumption one, but it depends whether you want to get more questions in. So, I, I mean, it's people have been asking this for the 30 years that we've been publishing. And it's the, 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 the circular economy is something that has emerged as a kind of business solution to this. Or oh, we don't need to reduce if it's all circular. And that's great because the business is, is frankly panicked by the idea of reducing consumption because it doesn't work. And... Uh, so, well, you know, it, it doesn't work in, in simple terms. And so circular economy is one thing that, that people have been trying to discuss as a way of, of trying to dodge the question. I think the other thing to, to point out is that people think that, that clearly, you know, pricing of products is an issue. And what will happen is if companies, uh, you know, if we're pricing carbon properly, like David wanted, and if we're, companies are taking responsibility for end of life products, like Ollie wanted, you know, the cost of stuff is going to rise because the costs are being properly shared by who does it. Um, and so we're going to have few more stuff that lasts better which is good. However, the problem with that is, is that we live in a massively unequal society. And another, you know, making lots of cheaper products is also, uh, it's an excuse for not looking at redistribution of wealth properly. And we kind of need to crack that too. <laughs> so it's really difficult. It's not only... Can I just make another comment? Sorry, I mean, you need to be... um, accessible pricing, I think, is very, very important to us. 
Um, and when we look at our products, we do see fair pricing, which is important, which does mean a lot of pricing, because some, sometimes you see sustainability coming up such an increase in a price tag, and you see something that you know the cost of, and when you see the, the, the price that people are charging for, you think, oh, come on, that's just ridiculous, there's property income going on here, because people are, are, are pricing in sustainability from a conscious perspective, which I don't think is right. And you can, through good selection of materials and good fabric selection and good design with good quality fabrics, good quality factories, you can make really, really good, well thought out products that are durable and recyclable without putting an extra 20% on the price tag. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, Naomi Arnold has asked a great question. So she has said no one has spoken about the use of toxic chemicals on outdoor clothing, especially waterproofs. So what are companies doing to eliminate um, poisonous PFAs, which are polluting our waterways and harming ecosystems? Well, there's a few. I mean, obviously, there's, I think a lot of fabric textile mills are moving away from, you know, using PFC water repellency you know um, I think one of the, the newer I guess ways around it is actually in, in the weave of, of um, fabrics as well so you make it naturally water repellent and windproof because you just have a kind of a tighter weave of all the fibres so you can do away with the additives altogether you know and so um, obviously there's, there's still all the fabric that has been made that does have the PFCs and you know that's a question in itself it's like well what do you do you know the, the carbon footprints are already there for those fabrics you know how do we how do we use them because it, if you make products from them you know they're still gonna leak those pfcs into the waterway so it's a bit of a you know an awkward one but i think developments i think the pressure from consumers then to brands and then on to textile mills is making a change i think it's you know from from when I go around like textile fairs and, you know, from what used to be a small collection of uh, recycled or sustainable fight, you know, in again, catch all term, but um, textiles is suddenly expanding because people are seeing, well, there's actually a business in it as well. So people are incentivized or textile mills are incentivized to make solutions to these problems as well. That's excellent. Thank you, Ali. Um, I think we've got time just for one final very quick question. Um, there's a, a specific one for Alpcat actually from Rosie Watson, and she'd like to know how Alpkit chose their offsets. Um, she says from experience as a sustainability consultant, there's ones that are meaningful, um, and um, which ones have we gone for? So, one for you, David. So, yeah, thank you. So as, um, just to recap, we do cal calculate a scope one, scope twos, and we know what our CO2 emissions were, which is about 60 tonnes last year, scope one, scope two. And I completely echo Rob's point that scope one, scope two in, in isolation is hard, you know, a fraction of the issue. And we're working with all of our suppliers to understand scope threes. And then reckon, and on our path to net zero and doing our bit, we're probably seeing something like uh, targeting a 90% absolute reduction in our scope one, scope twos, and something expect something like about 40% reduction in our absolute levels of scope threes, notwithstanding the growth, and only looking for renewables in setting and not offsetting as part of that. So just offset the balance. Um, but recognizing that we do uh, currently scope one, scope two is about 60 tons, as in the situation is that, well, do we offset and recognizing that it's not perfect. And I think, well, of course I would offset knowing what it is. And we've chosen to offset through UK tree planting um, and accredited UK tree planting methods. So it's effectively uh, uh, planting trees in the UK is our chosen, is our chosen route. There were other, other alternatives were available to people and you can buy a little certificate and which costs something like 300 quid for six, <laughs> for 60 tons, which I kind of I take with a pinch of salt. So um, you do it because you feel it's the right thing to do, but I don't want to be perceived as jumping on a bandwagon as, as that it's part of the solution. 
Okay, fantastic. Thank you, David. Well, thank you for, for all those answers today, really comprehensive. Um, and I'd just like to thank um, all our panellists for taking time to speak to us today. It's been great to share all your knowledge and viewpoints. And I think we all understand that no one of us alone has all the answers to sustainability. But if we work together to focus on sustainability, then we can really help build more sustainable businesses. So thanks again to Rob. Um, please do check out Ethical Consumer Magazine website. It's such a fantastic resource um, and it really does help you make informed decisions of where to buy from. So thank you, Rob. Also, big thank you to Ollie for Morvello. So again, I definitely recommend having a look at morvello.com. So I um, I particularly enjoyed reading that the sustainability section and the fantastic progress you've made in the last year on that. It's been brilliant. Also, thank you to Kate from B-Lab UK. Um, I know you're so busy at the moment, Kate. I know there's a huge demand for, for B Corps at the moment and such an exciting time for the B Corp movement. Definitely worth checking out the B Corp assessment, as Kate mentioned earlier. It's free on their website, so it's great um, to go and have a look at that. And I think I can speak for everybody at Alpkit when I say we're, we're so proud to be part of the B Corp movement. Finally, a big thank you to David and also a big thank you to Alice. So Alice is our marketing manager who's been furiously working behind the scenes to make everything work at the webinar today. So thank you, Alice. Um, our next webinar is going to be on climbing and it's going to be on Wednesday, the 17th of February. It's going to feature Anna Wells, Pete Whitaker, Rob Greenwood. And we hope it'd be great to see so many of you there um, as possible. Thank you so much for everybody taking the time to listen today we hope you enjoyed it we hope to see you all again soon so thank you very much and goodbye for now thank you thanks everyone bye thanks kate thanks rob thanks Holly.